Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we may have some more people joining us, but I think um, I'm going to go and get started on the introductions. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today um, <clears throat> for part two of this very special series. Um, we ask that you please remain muted during the presentation to respect our speaker and other attendants, and you may choose to keep your cameras on and off, on or off, um, whatever you prefer. This program will have a Q&A session for the last 15 minutes. And thank you for your feedback from part one. We will definitely make sure to get to the Q&A um, for the last 15 minutes this time, but you are free to add your questions in the chat at any point and they will be addressed during the Q&A in order. Um, a video recording of the program will also be uploaded to YouTube and shared to all the registrants in the next few days following this event. Um, let's see. We will also be sharing um, a similar questionnaire as last time if anyone would like to share any feedback or questions or topics that you'd like to be addressed in part three. And to get started and introduce our speaker for tonight, um, Adam specializes in Japanese wooden construction, trained as a craftsman through the Japanese apprenticeship system. His understanding of traditional architecture benefits from an access to generations of accumulated wisdom. Having spent 20 year, 21 years studying and building in Japan, he's sensitive to the cultural and env environmental influences that shaped this iconic architecture. He's active in the protection of historical buildings through restoration efforts and educational programs, as well as committed to maintaining the relevance of traditional skills and methods by applying them successfully in a modern context. So without any further ado, I'll let Adam take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, um, everyone. Um, I'm glad that you uh, that uh, that there was this much interest in uh, in the series. And the second part um, is going to be a little bit more, um, well, it's going to be broad, mainly because I think our viewership is broad. And um, in the uh, description of the program, I was talking about uh, describing Japanese architecture, uh, the vernacular architecture of the farmhouse and uh, the machia, the merchant house. And I'm realizing that uh, because there's so much to talk about, that I'm going to limit it a little bit more to uh, just the farmhouse this time. And uh, it, it would be, if people are interested, please in the comments say uh, say so. And maybe we can make uh, another addition to the series at some point and make uh, a never ending uh, commentary on Japanese architecture and building practices. Um, but um, the, the idea is that um, I wanted to explain that there's something very different about Japanese architecture when compared to Western architecture. And it comes down to the idea of how we perceive uh, the craftsman versus the architects. And um, when you look at the Japanese uh, style of building, it has a very long history of being um, uh, basically um, developed through the act of making it. Um, and that's something that was common throughout the world. But in Japan, the idea of the apprenticeship and uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, oyakata and deshi uh, system where you uh, you pass on information and techniques and and styles of doing things in a very very uh, strict way you end up with an aesthetic and a way of doing things that that doesn't that, that goes unchanged for a very long time and what that allows it to to, to do is is to get a, a very significant depth and so what i'd like to do is start off with a series of photos and um, I'm going to start off with the, uh, with the farmhouse, the Kominka. And the pictures that I have um, are starting from about 300, uh, buildings were built about 300 years ago in the Edo period. So this, this first picture of, is of a house that uh, is actually quite close to where I am. And uh, it's owned by uh, friends of, of, of my family. And we're, we're quite good friends. And, it's, it was established to have been built in the Edo period, uh, 250 years ago, close to 300 years ago. And for that reason, there's funding from the, uh, the government to protect it. Um, and it's actually very difficult because the thatching on the roof, uh, it uh, has a tendency to decay very quickly. Um, and the reason for that is that the way houses were used in the past is very different to the way they're used now. Um, meaning that uh, old houses had 
um, a hearth on the inside and no chimney. And so you can see a little bit of discoloration at the top here. I think you can see my cursor. Um, at the end of the eave here, there's some discoloration. That's where the, the smoke comes out through the roof. And that constant smoking of the building is what gives the inside that patina that I think everybody is, is semi-familiar with, that minka, the, the, black, the black finish on the inside, the posts and the beams, is because of the smoking, smoking process. And so from the outside of the building, I'll talk about some things that are very iconic uh, from this period of, of, of Japanese houses, is you have these long eaves. And the reason why you have these long eaves is because there's a very long rainy season in Japan. Um, starting from uh, the um, uh, beginning of, uh, of, of June, um, right into July, it rains a lot. And that's the, considered to be the monsoon period. So once thing, things get wet, they don't dry out very easily. And what you probably notice from the picture is that these Japanese farmhouses are all natural materials. There's no painting, there's no finishing, there's no attempt to preserve the, uh, the materials. And so it's required that they're protected by the structure. So you have these long eaves, protect the walls. And I think someone mentioned that um, uh, in, our last, uh, in our last portion in September was the outside walls, um, if they're covered with the plaster, with the white plaster, aren't they uh, durable and weatherproof? Um, this period of, of, of building didn't have plaster very often on the outside because it was a very expensive finish. So what you're seeing is this brown is clay. It's just clay walls. And so it's actually quite vulnerable to being wet and getting direct rain hitting it. So you can see the bottom here, there's some wood paneling and that's the intent to preserve and protect the bottom of the building from water splashing back on it. Uh, this picture here, this is something that I think people may be recognized from Shirakawago, it's a UNESCO site in uh, Gifu Prefecture in, uh, in the mountains of, of Japan. And this is an iconic kind of minka, it's called Yasho Zukuri. And it's a very large building. Um, generally, you had at least three generations uh, living in the building, and there are three stories in these buildings. And one thing you'll notice from the previous photo and this is that you still have a very steep roof pitch. And the roof pitch is steep because thatching isn't really waterproof. Thatching will stop rain from going, going straight down slowly, but you have to have a steep pitched roof in order for the water to wick all the way down before it goes through the roof. And this is a series of photos that I'll start with now. Uh, this is in, Shira, in, in Shikoku. There's a site where quite a few buildings have been um, uh, moved to, restored and moved to um, for an open, open air museum. And so we're starting off with this thatch roofing is continu continuing. And you can see that you still have that very steep uh, pitch. And you have a spot under the eave here um, for, uh, for drying. And that's called the Engawa. There's a wooden, a wooden uh, platform. Um, and an area for, for drying uh, vegetables and uh, preserving um, uh, grains and, uh, and uh, uh, legumes. And this is interesting. In Shikoku, uh, it was very common for people to be using bamboo for that same kind of protection. Uh, so this is what I talked about last time was that uh, natural materials are in, in essence quite, quite fragile, quite vulnerable. And so there was this idea of protecting the clay. Um, and bamboo is actually quite interesting because it grows very, very quickly. I think most people are aware that it, uh, it only grows, it gets to its maximum height in one year. And so after one year, uh, you can cut it and use it. Um, but uh, if you wait for an, an, an additional two years, it becomes more durable. But if you compare uh, two or three years versus the, the 40 or, or 50 years that you'd have to wait for wood, to mature, uh, for a tree to mature to be milled, um, it's uh, it's it's a it's a very usable material. And the idea, so it's it's in, in essence, it's, it's semi aesthetic, but in reality, it's completely functional. It's protect the walls from water bouncing off the ground and hitting them. And this is another view, and a close up of the 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 ingawa. And I think uh, Naoko realized these are uh, hoshigaki, uh, dried persimmons, which is uh, actually a very, a very interesting thing. A lot of foods in Japan, um, like the ume and uh, the, the kaki, the persimmon, they're very astringent. Uh, you can't eat them raw. 
Uh, they're actually, um, there's, there's a, a chemical in this that's not good for your stomach. And so there's various ways that they have to be uh, prepared in order to make them edible. Uh, so uh, the umeboshi, the pickled, uh, you know, salty uh, plum is, is, is that. And uh, the kaki, you have to dry them in order to make them sweet and get rid of that astringent uh, flavor. So this is another view from the bottom of the eaves. And the bamboo again. And this is interesting in my area. And the first slide that I showed you, like I said that Japanese houses, when they were built in this period, there were no architects. There was no one planning individually for the client what kind of house they'd like to have. There was a set style that was developed over a very long time, and it was similar in an area. There was very little deviation. And it reminds me a lot of a, 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 an interesting conversation I had when I was working up on an old house up in the mountains where I used to live. Um, the grandmother there, she said something very interesting. There was a young couple that had moved into the village and they had started uh, growing vegetables. And she was saying to me, it's, it's very, very difficult for them. And I said, what, what do you mean? And she said, it's very, very difficult because you only get the test once a year. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, all the things you have to do up here in the, in the mountains, they have to be done right every time. And if you get it wrong that year, your vegetables won't grow properly if you don't plant the seeds at the right time. Or if your house isn't oriented in the right way, it's not gonna last very long, right? So there's this long, long development of wisdom. And it's, it's very interesting because all houses, even now, in the majority of Japan, have the entranceway facing south. And the picture you're looking at right here, it's facing south. And the reason for that, especially in the mountains, is that you have to maximize your sun exposure. And the sun is free energy. It dries your house, it heats your house, it dries your vegetables, it dries your clothes, and it stops the house from rotting. And it warms inside of the house. So we'll talk about the layouts of the old houses a little bit later on, but that's something that does not deviate. And it was interesting because when I went to Shirakawa Go, I was in one of the old houses and I, 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 was, I was walking in and out and walking in and out. And there was an old woman there. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, I, I, I don't think this house is facing south. And she said, it's not. And I said, why? And she says, obviously, it's facing east and west. And I said, that's not right. She said, yes, it is. It's 100% correct. And I said, well, what do you mean? She says, we're not in the mountains, right? And you can tell that our houses aren't, they don't have, a, 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 you know, thatching on all sides like this house. Their houses have thatching on two sides only. And they have wood windows on each side. And so if the house is facing east to west, you're maximizing the amount of sun that's going over the thatch to dry the buildings. So based where she lives, that's an obvious way to make houses. And they've been made that way for a very, very long time. Whereas this house, the back is facing the mountains, right? And you've got thatching all around on four sides. And so the occupants want to have as much sun as possible going into the house to warm it up and to keep it dry. And this is also interesting. There's, there's this wooden structure on the side here. What this is, is a stable. And this is an old, old house. And so it's on the outside of the, the, uh, the, of the house. Uh, the first picture that I showed you was actually on the inside. The, the, the horses were on the inside of the house. And they were in the best part of the house. Because the sun rises in the east. And it's the first part, it's the first place to warm up. And it has the, 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 the best sun in the morning to warm it up. And then as the sun moves to the, to, the, to the south side, it gets hotter. And the hottest sun, or the sun that feels the hottest, is on the east. Right? And so most kitchens, most preparation areas are on the east side. And when, uh, in the day when there weren't tractors or any kind of you know, farm equipment, uh, the most important member of the family was the horse. And so the horse got the east side. And this is a view of the, uh, the foundation. And this is something that I think is 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 very rare in in, in the West. It's very common. Is is very rare. I'm like, is the audio okay? Is the audio okay? 
I think we're getting a bit of a, a, bit of a feedback. Is that on my side? Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think we should be okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the sliding door. This is the sliding door. And it's something that is very iconic in the, in the east, on the outside of the, of the, the house, not on the inside, dividing the, the, the portions of the house. And the interesting thing about a sliding door is where I live, and in the most parts of the, uh, Japan, it's okay for you to open it from the outside, especially in a farmhouse. If someone comes, they don't knock on the door, they slide the door open. And the nice thing is that a sliding door is analog. You can slide it just a little bit and poke your nose in and say hello, right, without having to, you know, uh, cause a, a stir, right? Um, so it's very, very Japanese to be able to control that boundary or that division point between the outside and the inside. And that's something that I'm going to sort of talk about more and more in this in this portion of the series, is that the Japanese house is a blend between the outside and the inside. It's progressive. There isn't this idea of shutting the outside out. And one of the reasons for that is that Japan has four seasons. And when I came to Japan, I said, well, yeah, I, Canada has four seasons too. <laughs> Most people divide the calendar in, in four. <laughs> for four seasons anywhere in the world. But what I was told, and it's true, once you live, live here for a while, it's a very distinct four parts of the year. And what people do, uh, the kind of things that they do in their everyday life, changes as the seasons change, especially in the farming community. So the houses change during the year. They expand and contract in the in the warmer season and in the in the cooler season right so there isn't that idea of the inside and the outside is progressive so the idea of the sliding door the sliding door will open up to the doma and this is a a, a video hopefully uh oh there we go And these are short clips going from one side and the other. So this is the doma. And the doma is a very important part of the Japanese house. And in this house, it is on the opposite side. That's the city in Shikoke then, but not, not the same in the island. But it steps up into the rest of the house. And what that doma is, it's a compacted earth floor. And I think I talked about it a little bit in the last part of the series. It's important because it's earth. It's inside the house, but it's outside. It's that gray zone where you can do your farming work with your shoes on. Um, it's actually connected to the ground. It's not concrete. So you get humidity coming through the floor, evaporating on the inside of your house, causing a cooling system, which is very, very, very convenient in the summer. And you would normally have um, that extending into the stable area. You'd also have your kamado, which is a stove. It's a wood-fired stove uh, made out of earth and clay uh, that's also in the doma. And it was basically all the stuff you had to do that you didn't want to do outside in the hot sun or outside under the, you know, in the rain. Uh, you wanted to have that space inside your house. And that's why the Japanese farmhouses were so big. About a third of it was the doma. And the doma was free space. Even now, um, if you go up in the mountains and you walk into the house, you can slide the door open and say hello, and you can take a step into the dome and no one's going to get upset. No one will worry at all, right? And it was necessary to have that free space so you could talk about village issues, village topics, uh, keep connections with your neighbors. Because in Japan, you have a rice community and you have a water system that's shared by everybody in the village. And there has to be constant communication to make sure that everything runs well. Now, it's really difficult in a, in, a, in a Western house or in a modern house in Japan, in Tokyo, to go visit your neighbors on the spur of the moment, right? Uh, especially in Japan, in the apartments, you don't have anything. You just have this door that you have to open to the outside right, and swing out towards your, 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 your guest, right? <laughs> Maybe hit them on the way you know, as you're doing it, right? It's very, very stressful. But the doma was designed to be this free space where you could go in with your shoes on. And you could sit down. You could tell when, when I when I'll, I'll 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 go through through this part here. Um, there is um, a, a step up. 
that you can see if we, if we go through this again. There's a step into the gamma. And there's a small step in this house to the left. Normally be on the right, mind you, right there. And that's a place to sit, right? So you can sit there and talk about uh, village business with your shoes on, right? Um, and wait for the person in the house to say, do you want to come in? Do you want to come in for a cup of tea? And if they do, then it's giving you the opportunity to say yes or no. Right. If you say no, it means you're busy and there's no problem. You can leave and be polite about it. And the, the meeting's finished. Now, after that, that allotted amount of time, you've talked about village business. And if the person in the house has not asked you to come in, I got the kudasai. That's what you say in, in, in Japanese. I got the is to come up because there's a step. I got the kudasai. If they don't say I got the kudasai, it means they're busy. And once the business is done, they need to get back to their daily stuff. So it's a good idea for you to, to leave. So there's that totally uh, easy, free way of getting in and out of that house without causing problems and doing the, 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 the communication you need to have in the village without having any problems. And even to this day, farm communities, people are so comfortable that they just open the door, they slide it open, and they step into your genka, right, or your doma, or the entrance way to your house. And that's something that um, tradition, uh, architecture supports tradition, supports culture. And when architecture changes because of the seasons or because of the current trend or because an architect wants to become famous, then it has problems because it impacts the way people live and as a result, it impacts the culture. And that's something that I think people in Japan are feeling a little bit of. So this next picture is the inside of the house and this house is old. And you can tell that it's not divided into small rooms. And there's a very good reason for that. And even now, Japan, Japanese houses don't have a lot of furniture, mainly because you want to have free space. Uh, you'd have multi-generations in this house. You'd have your grandparents and your parents and you if you were a kid, right? Or your kids if you were a parent, right? Or your kids and grandchildren if you were a grandparent. And the idea was that it took more than one generation to run the household. And there wasn't any idea of lodging, lodging houses or retirement homes. And so uh, the parents needed to be taken care of when they were getting uh, to the point where they needed it. And it was something that was very natural. And the reason why that wasn't a problem was because normally the older generations built part of the house. Because a house like this, and even bigger houses than this, especially the ones in, in Chicago, uh, they, took, they took a huge amount of time and effort to make. And so it wasn't considered to be possible to build a house for one generation. It wasn't, it was an insane idea. And even now, if you think about the amount of time that it would take for these trees to grow, it would be a waste to have this house only last one generation. And so in a modern context, you look at this, and some people might like this house, some people might not, that's taste. Um, but people who do, their eyes directly go to the beams those black curved beams, those beautiful beams in the ceiling, people want those now. And you definitely think that that was probably the best part of this house. That was the most expensive part of this house. But 200, 300 years ago, that wasn't true. 200, 300 years ago, these were the most expensive because you had a lot of them in the house. These are floorboards. And back in the day, there weren't, there weren't sawmills making these planks for you. There was an automated system with, with metal cutting wood. Um, these were planed on the surface that was going to be used. It was going to be facing up. And you can see there's a sheen there. That sheen isn't any kind of glossy wax or oil or anything like that. That's over 100 years worth of, of care, of wiping it down, of, 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 of wiping the dust off of it, people's feet on the floor, the kids running across it with their, their bare feet, it makes that shine. And the darkness, the, 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 the blackness is the soot and the hurt. And the bottom is hewed. <laughs> so each plank was hewed, it was split. Uh, the side that was gonna be facing up was, was plain smooth and the bottom was hewed to make it flat. And then the part that was gonna be sitting on what we call a girder would be hewed to, to fit the round log that was the girder. So it was a huge amount of effort to make these boards. And there was quite a lot of them in the house. And 
there's lots of books being written about these houses and a lot of people say that they were designed for the Japanese summer. That's why they were so openable. That's why you had all these, these walls that could be slid open so there'd be you know, air moving through them. So that the occupants would be comfortable during the hot summer. And in a modern context, that's obvious, of course, because human beings need houses to protect themselves, right? That's why we build them, right? Um, but there's an interesting an analogy, an interesting story that I'll add to the, the conversation is if you work with your hands, for example, you're gonna work in the garden or you're gonna go do some, some kind of, um, uh, some kind of uh, physical labor, a lot of people like to wear gloves to protect their hands, right? And so if you wear those gloves for one day, they'll get a little bit dirty, right? And the next day, if you wear the same gloves, they'll get a little bit dirtier. And maybe they'll get a little bit worn in the, in the fingertips, right? Three days, four days, you might develop small holes in the fingertips. And after a week of using the same gloves, it's, I'm pretty confident that they'll be, you know, fairly, fairly tattered, right? And your fingers will be sore, <laughs> I could imagine, right? But the next day, the, uh, the gloves are still stat tattered, but your fingers are getting better. After two days or three days, your fingers are totally back to normal. And that's what human beings can do. Human beings are incredibly resilient. And 200 years ago, people were more resilient maybe. And so it was a team effort between the house and the people inside it. And the way I see this house is this house is not is not built to be comfortable, it's built to last. Now those floorboards, if they were to rot, that would be a big problem. And you can see the coloration of this floorboard. It's really, really old and it's not rotten, right? So that's why the floor was so high. That's why there was air traveling underneath the floor. That's why they were wiping it down, getting the dust off of it, getting any kind of nutrition that could um, lead to, 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 to mold growth off of it. It was to keep, keep the house from falling apart, to keep the house in good repair. And if the house was in good repair, then people could live in the house, right? It was a team effort. And that's something that you'll see in these old pictures of these houses is that they age really, really well. They get a patina to them. They get a coloration that I think people kind of enjoy. And it's not painted, it's not planned, it's not designed. That's taking care of it, uh, spending time with it, and having it age and change. And that's something that I'm sort of setting up the conversation for our third portion of the series. And now we're looking at the Eve again. And what's interesting is if you look at this picture and then we switch to this picture, it's similar but different. But this house is only 70 years old, right? And so that's that idea of the craftsman having this um, image in their head of what a house is and that not being designed. It gets developed, it gets aged, it gets changed over time, but it's based on a very, uh, uh, let's say, consistent aesthetic. And I think that's what a lot of people enjoy about Japanese architecture is that it's not uncomfortably different all the time. It has a similar thread that runs right through it. And this is the 70 year old building. This is not far from where I live. And I enjoy this building. I, we did a, an article or a magazine about it called Details. And it was about all the views, all the things you could look at in this building from the outside. There are so many things to look at. And this is um, in Kawasaki in uh, Ise. And it's a totally different, this is a street. This is um, a merchant house, but the aesthetic's not entirely different because there's no coloration that's unnatural. The wood changes the same way. It changes the same color. And the smoked, the low temperature smoked uh, uh, tiles that we talked about last time are the same. Now, this is something that uh, we talked about before the Ishibatate. This is before we had concrete. Uh, this is before uh, people were making strip foundations and, and, uh, and, and pad foundations and what have you. And this is a very good way to support a building, mainly because um, I, I talked to a, a good friend of mine. He's, he's a fairly significant person in Japan. He's, a, he's one of the uh, head torios in Nara, uh, responsible for, for several uh, temples. And he says, look at this and imagine all the weight 
going straight down onto the stone. That's what the wood is set up to do. That's what trees are, that's the way trees are grown. You take all the weight and have it translate straight down to the ground, right? And stone is really, really good because at least this kind of stone doesn't wick any kind of moisture through it like concrete does. And probably you've noticed through the pictures is that there's a lot of labor in all the things we've seen. This stone is not cut straight or flat. We can do that now quite easily, but then uh, 200 years ago, you could chip at it for a long time. And a lot of people in temples do that, but that would be a waste of time, mainly because this, this curve, this crown on the top is perfect because it locks the post. The post won't shift or won't move, provided you make that same, same shape on the bottom of the post. And that takes time and effort and skill to do it properly, right? But when it's done properly, it's perfect. And this is something you'll see consistent in a lot of buildings. And this is over the span of 100 years. The difference between the, the photos, they span about that much time. And this is sort of a detail. I, I enjoy this. Um, this is um, a, a, a windowsill on the outside of the building. And it doesn't go straight down. It's not straight. There's a small detail at the bottom. And this house was built in the Edo period. That's another view of it. And then we shift to the house that was built 70 years ago. Right, a little bit more intricate, a little more detailed, right? But it's still the same kind of, uh, maybe you could say fun that the person had when they made the house, right? That's the other side of it. And uh, uh, more of a back view, I guess. Okay, and this is the same idea, um, just another example. This house is also from the Edo period. Um, you can see here that there's, um, there's that wood uh, planking across the bottom. That's of course to, to keep the, uh, the, the earth from, from, from de de degrading. And that's a, an, up, an up close detail. This is structurally important. If this wasn't here, uh, what's supporting the roof would be, would be very weak comparatively, right? So this is a structural element, but just having a, a, um, a let's say a, a triangle or something put there, no, it's carved. And it's really, really interesting because if you look at this kind of age of building, you would probably use the word rustic. That's a good adjective to use, I think. But there's something that's not rustic about it. And that's that strange gap that I really enjoy in, in, in Japanese architecture. Is this hand, it's handmade, and this is, this is a, a, from the, uh, uh, the 70 year old house, but in, in context. So that's one little section I want to talk about. Those are the exterior of the buildings. And a lot of the stuff that we looked at was purely functional, but it wasn't just functional. It was kind of uh, done in a way that was interesting, done in a way that took some time and effort. And that's because the person who actually made the house was the one who decided how they're going to make it. And while they were doing it, they enjoyed it. And when you enjoy doing something that you're doing, you probably do a better job at it. And you don't mind doing it for longer. You don't mind if it takes a little bit more time. And so now this is going back into the house. And this is what's more similar where I live, is that you have the doma on the, on the east side of the house. And so, so then again, you can see here, there's that, uh, that the kamado. This is the, uh, the stove or the, the oven, the earth oven. And uh, the, the kamachi, this is where you'd sit. And this house was fairly uncommon, mainly because there was not common to have tatami in this area of the house. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, maybe I'll talk about it now. <laughs> you notice that the other houses, they had planking here as well. Tatami was not allowed in farmhouses 250 years ago. People who lived in farmhouses weren't allowed to have tatami. They weren't allowed to sleep on tatami. That was for the higher level of society, the daimyos or the samurai. And it was dangerous because if you had tatami in your house, and the front of the house where most people did their living and their working, then that meant that you were the one sleeping on it, right? Which was not a good thing. It was more common to have tatami in the back in what's behind this wall. You can see where this, this was is. And the reason why it was there was because I said before, the east side of the house is usually the hottest. Um, the, the house gets heated up during the day by all the sun hitting it. And right at the end, it's getting the, the last bit of the sun going directly on the east side of the building. So it gets hotter. So it's not an easy place to spend time. It's not an easy place to sleep, especially in the summer. 
So that area was usually used for guests, not to sleep, but to entertain during the day because you had some nice lighting, but they wouldn't sleep there. And they were normally the people who would come to collect taxes. So they were quite important people. So a lot of the villages had one large building that was called the, the home K. It was the, the, head, the, head, the, head, the head family, the head of the family, or the head of the village. And they always had those two rooms, at least one, if not two, on the east side of the building to entertain the guests and the tax collector. It was less common to have up in the mountains because up in the mountains, you didn't grow rice as much. And so they weren't taxed as much. And so they're a little bit more free, it would seem, right? And that's really interesting, mainly because I touched on it a little bit last time, was that uh, these mountain settlements, they were made for various reasons. In a lot of cases, uh, they were people who were on the wrong side of, a, of, of a, a dispute or a battle, or they were connected to a family that was on the wrong side of the dispute, and they couldn't live in the comfortable, uh, wide, um, uh, flat areas of Japan, which are surprisingly very few of them. If you come to Japan, you have a look. Uh, Tokyo is very big and wide, and Saitama is quite wide, it's the Kanto Plain. But as soon as you get into the mountains, you don't have a lot of flat space at all. And so that was very, very valuable land, and it's where you could grow the most rice. And so if you didn't have a strong family or if you weren't connected to a strong family, you moved up into the mountains. But as a result, you didn't have to pay as much tax. And so your house was more easy to build the way that you wanted to build it because you didn't have a tax collector coming to, 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 to collect tax and checking to see if you had tatami where you should or shouldn't. So it's actually kind of a long way of explaining that in a lot of places, uh, a, a difficult place to live was actually a little bit easier. Um, and this is another view. This is a samurai's house. Um, and it was not at all uncommon to have a tatami um, right in the entranceway. And this here is, is called a tokonoma. It's a, uh, an alcove. It's a, a decorative alcove. And uh, I think some people are familiar with the fact that you put a, a scroll and maybe a, a flower arrangement in that area. So this is not something that you would commonly have in a farmhouse right at the entrance of the house. And this is an also an evolution. We're going from a very rustic, older style to something that was built a little bit earlier, or rather not earlier, a little bit later um, in the Meiji period. And you can see that you have the same motifs, but it's changing just a little bit, being a little bit more refined and a little bit more carefully, uh, carefully done. And now we talk about the hearth. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm going back uh, 250, 300 years. This is the hearth. This is the main source of heat in the building. Um, it's the reason why everything turns black. And it's the main reason why things don't rot. Because all that thatching up in the roof has a tendency to attract insects, uh, hold humidity, and things that have insects and humidity, and the uh, nutrition that insects leave behind uh, rots very, very quickly. And so the smoke coming from the hearth right up through the, uh, through the thatch was critical uh, to keeping the house from, from deteriorating. And that's what made the house so, so dark and coloration and this is a little bit a little bit later and then we're moving into the uh, into the Meiji period where it's the same idea you have a hearth here but that's mainly for entertaining and you're getting very a lot less coloration because it's not used at all or a very 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 uh, little compared to the the, the, the rest of farmhouses and storage Storage was uh, what we think now is critical for houses, but um, in, uh, in that period, there were tansu. Uh, there were uh, uh, chests of drawers. And the reason for that is that they were portable, they were movable. And it was very common for the, 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 the new wife to bring her belongings into the house in, in a set of a chest of drawers. And that's where all of her belongings would stay and she could take them from, from, from them. So it wasn't really necessary to have closets uh, or what have you built into the house. And this is the same idea. This is a chadansu. Uh, that's where you put all your, uh, your, uh, uh, your well, I wouldn't say silverware, but your cups and your plates. And this is uh, a, a sort of a, a, a primitive beginning of the, uh, of the, the, the decorative um, alcove, the uh, um, tokurama. And this is the kamidana. Kamidana, it's um, uh, the god shelf. 
And I, we haven't talked about that at all, but in Japan, the uh, indigenous uh, religion is, is Shinto. And Shinto, I think some of you are aware, is, is it's, um, uh, it's, it's worship of natural gods, uh, uh, energies in nature. And something that seems to tie a lot of things together. You've seen through these pictures, there's not a single piece of plastic. Very little metal, in fact. Uh, all wood, clay, straw, uh, tile, which is your clay as well. Right? All these materials are directly taken from the area around the house. And that's where you have all those curved beams. And this is something that I, I learned when I was working in the forestry group, is that you can basically guarantee that one area of mountain that produces trees will only give you about 25% straight trees. And those are really, really important, really important, because those are your posts. And your posts really should be straight, right? And you also want to make some money out of this too, so you have to sell them, right? And you also want to make your, uh, your floorboards out of relatively straight stuff. So the next maybe 50% are slightly curved, so that's giving you 75%. You can still use them for your for your uh, the, uh, the the plates and the and the uh, and the girders, and you're you're basically getting less and less straight stuff after that, and that's all going into the into the roof. And the curved roof beams, um, it, was, it would be a long way to go back, but might as well do it here. Ah, these are red pine. In some cases, in really really nice houses, they're kiaki Japanese alcova. Uh, but Japanese alcova is really, really heavy. It's strong, but it's also very heavy. So it's very difficult to get it up into the roof when you don't have a crane. And it also puts a lot of stress on the building. It's heavier than it needs to be. But red pine is fantastic. And I think a lot of people who know about wood know that pine doesn't grow straight. It kind of likes to follow the sun. And it does this kind of, kind of twisting as it grows. And that's fantastic for beams because you're actually getting a carbon fiber construct. You're getting this helix of fibers that makes it very, very difficult to, 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 um, to split. And if you're good at using them, you crown them, you have the direction of the bow going up. So you've got a pre-stressed pre uh, beam. And that's why these aren't cut straight. That's why you have these iconic round faceted beams in the older buildings because they're the perfect material for what they're being asked to do. So moving through. Uh, talking about the furniture. And now we're getting to somewhere a little bit newer. This is um, a, a series of shots from buildings in um, Minoshi in Gifu. Uh, it was a, 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 a center for uh, Japanese washi, the best washi, the, the best Japanese paper in Japan was made in Mino. And the buildings in this part of the city, they were the merchants, the people who made a lot of money off this paper. And so there's some fantastic um, uh, examples of really, really nice architecture, not overly gaudy, uh, but very, very well done. So through these pictures, look that we're not, we've got a, a very consistent flavor. It's a little bit cleaner, it's a little bit, it's not as smoky, but you have the same color, coloration the same kind of aging. This is not painted. This is aging and, and coloration of the wood because of the, um, uh, they did burn charcoal for heating and uh, they, they did have um, uh, candles. So there was a, a certain degree of soot, but not as much. And this is another photo back in the Samurai house. And Adam, just to let you know, we are at 646. So oh, we want oh. to Start to transition just a little bit into questions. Yes. Okay. So, so what I'll do is I'll just go really quickly through this, um, and I think uh, we'll we'll just stay with this. I was planning to talk about structure as well, um, but I think we'll have to save that for another time. Um, so this is this is the series of photos. Is I wanted to stress the fact that where the aesthetic is coming from, what we now consider to be a very concrete Japanese aesthetic that we understand from around the world. Of the, tea, of the tea house, of this kind of the cloth, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the white paper walls or the white paper um, uh, screens and, uh, and the, the fine pieces of wood, they actually, that this aesthetic generated from the farmhouse. And you can see this is an old house that I worked on up in Nagano, it's 150 years old, and the clay has fallen off. And the substructure 
which is supporting that clay, is what you find the TFs. Because this original window that was contrived now in tea houses was exactly that, showing that when the clay comes off, that's the substructure that you have underneath inside the wall. And this is even more of a modern context. And even more of a modern context. And so as you start seeing this, you start realizing that the closer you look, the more and the more you see is that in this picture, you can see that the pattern of the these, these thin pieces of wood that you're getting in the screen is also expressed in the small piece of paper being overlapped. And this is Mino, typical Mino style, which is considered, considered to be very, very kind of uh, subdued. And this is the last picture in that, uh, in that sequence. So that's basically half of what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> The schedule. So, if um, if uh, I would like to talk about um, uh, Japanese structure and why buildings are the shape and sizes that they are, why we have this grid system in Japanese architecture that I think some people are aware of, it's a very important thing. Um, but it would seem like uh, we want to talk about have some questions, so we don't have time for that this evening. Uh, so let's, John, start with questions. Yeah. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to share them in the chat. Um... I don't know if if you think you could kind of briefly maybe show some of the photos that was on the agenda. Well, um, what it was, what it was is um, I'll stop the share of this, and um, I'll go into the three dimensional model. Well, one more question. Ah, what, yes, yes, please. What what steps were taken to avoid fires in the construction uh, of the homes, if any? Uh, fires were the biggest problem. And probably a lot of people know how fires move. They move from the eaves, right? They go from one building to the next um, because of the uh, the fire jumping from eave to eave. Uh, what fire goes up, right? And so um, uh, that's why uh, we needed to have the eaves here because they protect the house. But that's why a lot of the houses were lost to fire, a lot. Um, and so the first firemen, they were called the Toby Shoku. They were actually uh, they would dis dismantle the houses as the fire was moving in the cities. Uh, not such a problem in, in the in the, uh, the farmhouses because the houses were far far apart, right? But in the cities, you'd actually create fire breaks by dismantling houses uh, to stop it from spreading. Um, in the uh, in the farmhouses, uh, we were talking about having that fire on the inside of the building, and yes, that's that's why they're so large, and that's why there are no ceilings. Um, is that if you have small rooms with a fire in the center, yes, that's a major problem. It'll be very easy to lose your house that way. But having that wide open space. Uh, with the ceiling not there, in a lot of cases in, in Gifu, when those uh, the, the big houses in Shirakawa go, there's a cover that's suspended from the beams over the hearth. And in that area, it's solid. In some areas, it's it's a grid. So you can put stuff on top to smoke and, and dry and preserve. But in Gifu, because they were so worried about the, the fire, because it was all thatching, and it was a huge house, that they had a, a solid um, plank series of planks over the hearth to stop any kind of um, uh, embers or, or flying sparks from going up into the uh, into the into the, 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 the part of the roof. So yes, fire was a serious concern and people were very, very, very cautious about it. And over the hearth, you'll actually see um, that fish motif. Uh, some people have maybe are aware of that, that uh, what what um, it's a, um, an implement that um, is used to uh, suspend a, a kettle or a pot over the, the hearth. In a lot of cases, there's a fish, a carved fish, which is uh, supposed to be uh, protected protection against fire. Um, uh, in, in that, in that idea, yes. As you show the three D structure, um, oh. Joe is asking: Was there threat from insects, termites, mice, other pests? Of course, of course. Um, I think even now in the mountains, you see do get mice. Um, and in a lot of old houses, yes, there are entranceways that have been chewed in by mice. Uh, but that's the idea is that the storehouse, we talked about the kura a little bit last time, the dozu kuri, the, the, uh, the, the earth, the earth uh, houses, they actually were, were created to store your grain and your, 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 uh, your important uh, items. Uh, and they were relatively safe from, from, uh, from mice. Uh, they were fairly, they were built to be, to be difficult for the mice to get into. Um, 
that idea of termites okay termites they will they will eat your house if it's wet if there's anywhere in your house that stays damp then you'll have insect infiltration and damage by insects if it's dry there's very little of it and so that was that idea of having that that air moving underneath the floor keeping everything dry and having the wood uh the post sitting on stone meant that there was uh only the the bottom of the uh, of the, uh, the 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 post was in contact with the with the the stone, um, and that's really really quite good mainly because insects can't eat the center of trees. To to eat, so even if the exterior the the outside would become um, uh, damaged by insect infiltration, the center of the tree, the post, the load bearing portion would be not affected. So this, this is essentially um, a three-dimensional model of uh, a Japanese old-style house. And the reason why I have this slightly prepared is because a client of mine wants something like this. And he's taking it to the extreme where it's maybe a, even a little bit too traditional, in my opinion, for modern construction, but it's something that he wants to do. And so I'm supporting it. Um, and I made some small different, small changes, but very, very little. Um, and... If you can tell, before I build the, the structure, this dotted line here, this is a, a, a cross. Now, if I were to go in this direction, 910 millimeters, it will come on the center of the next post. And if I go in this direction, 1,820, I'm on the center of the next post. And 910. There you go. And in the other direction, you can do the same thing. 910. And that's easy to see that Japanese houses are essentially a grid. And they've been that way for a very, very long time. And that 910 is not millimeters. I mean, that's what it's become in millimeters, but it's sanjaku. One shaku is arguably within millimeters of one foot. It is almost exactly the same. But in the Japanese system, it's divided not in 12, but by 10, which is absolutely fantastic. If, if, if you're used to imperial and having to, to, to deal with fractions, it's kind of a headache if you're not used to it. Um, but when you divide things by 10, there are no fractions. And so you have a, a 10 base system, which is anatomically correct. That's why people like imperial. That's why they like feet um, and not metric so much, right? And so this, this very, very old, old Japanese measure, measuring system is what people wanted to have, even now in a modern context, is you've got this three by three, essentially three foot by three foot grid that your building exists on. And so it's very easy to make. And it's also very easy to assemble, disassemble. Um, when anybody comes on the site to help, they know exactly because there's a grid system with numbering systems that are easy to understand. All of your tatami, um, they're the right size. All of your shoji, they're the right size. It's a very, very old, very, very well-resolved uh, modular system. So that's something I, I definitely wanted to explain. And then um, going up with the structure, you'll see that there's something kind of interesting about it. There is no triangulation whatsoever. And so this is the core of the building. And uh, this is the core of the building and all of the connections are horizontal vertical and that's very important um, in the traditional japanese framing system if you have triangles if you have braces something that you have to this absolutely considered to be critical in western framing it will cause problems when you have an earthquake you want to have this house be able to shear back and forth 
Um, and that's really important because when it shears back and forth, if you have lots of connections really close together, what they do is it divides the force and the stress on the frame in very, very small parts. So none of the parts of the frame receives a significant amount of load and nothing will break on you. The house might stop being, uh, after the earthquake, it might stop and be off to the left or to the right or to the, the front or the back a little bit. But in, in the old days, it took so much time and effort to make a house for it to fall down and to be totally unusable was a big loss, a significant loss. And so even if the house was a little bit off to the side, it could be fixed. If any of the structure was broken and it's very difficult to, to, to replace structure, then the house would become unusable. So it was critical that stuff inside the frame didn't get damaged. The house as a whole, and this is something that I think you, you realize as we were going through this presentation, is that these are not boxes. These are objects. And they're not really spaces. They're places where people lived and they interacted with the structure, with this frame, with this object, right? If you didn't see the structure, and you notice in all the photographs, all the structure was expressed. If you didn't see it, if it was behind a white wall, if there was insect damage, you wouldn't know about it. And it would progress too far and your house would fall apart. And you couldn't fix it, right? Because you'd have to take all that finish off the inside, all the finish on the outside off in order to do anything to the house. So it was incredibly important, I'm stressing again, that this houses took a huge amount of energy to build, more than one generation's worth of energy. And making the materials took a lot of effort as well because we didn't have mechanism or mechanization. And so it was important that these houses lasted a long time. And that's why these houses can still last now. And that's kind of the, the big question we're gonna talk about in the next portion of the series is how has our lifestyles changed to make it not comfortable and not usable anymore? And is that a good thing? Yes, in a lot of ways it is good, it's important, but are there things within these houses that we can take and include in our current lifestyles uh, and not throw them away completely? So that's about as much as I was going to talk about today. Um, I apologize, you went fairly quickly uh, through the structure. Definitely, if you have questions about it, uh, in, the, in the third portion of the series, I'd like to address them. Um, and so if there's anything else that's come up uh, in, in the questions, I'd love to answer uh, if, if there's time. Yes. Um, if anyone thinks of any questions in these last couple of minutes, please definitely share them in the chat um, for now. I'm sending through the registration page for part three. Um, so you can already sign up to see Adam again um, in November, November 14th, I believe. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended tonight and especially thank you to all the attendees who donated to this program. And thank you for your support of JSB. My pleasure. Um, not seeing too many other questions and it is seven so we probably will wrap up for tonight but i hope that um some questions and further topics will be addressed in part three so hope everyone can look forward to that thank you adam so much oh, it's my pleasure